Hello, hello everybody. How are we all doing? Ellie here. And today we're going to be talking about change, my dear. And it seems not a moment too soon. Look, to quote Ross Geller, nobody likes change. I don't like change. You don't like change. But in time, we learn to accept it. I hated it when they changed Matt Smith's first title sequence. Absolutely hated it. But after a while, I... Oh, no. Actually, I still don't like the Series 7 title sequence. Okay, so that was a bad example. But the point is, Doctor Who has changed in ways both big and small, and many of these changes have been completely the right decision. So let's get into it. This is 10 Doctor Who changes that were completely justified. Number 10, it feels different this time. You'd imagine that a biological process would be fairly consistent in the way it works, but regeneration in the classic run was always a bit weird. Sure, you had the majority fall into the general box of whooshy effects around the face area, but then there were some outliers, like Seven Frankensteining himself into Eight, Two dropping acid and falling down a big hole, and Tom Baker getting a cuddle from a bald ghost made of cotton. Nobody seemed quite sure how they wanted regeneration to work. They weren't even consistent in whether the change happened pre or post death. Cue the revival, in which all three showrunners have remarkably seemed to be in agreement with the style established in 2005. Minus Matt Smith's little time sneeze, but he did already have his light show on the clock tower. This has been a nice connecting through line over the years, making jumps between doctors and showrunners a little less jarring, and frankly, it's a ruddy great great special effect too. Nothing says drama like having a little cry and shooting fireworks out of your head. Number 9, I'm over screwdrivers. We've had a little while now to sit on the recent Sonic screwdriver changes, and while the jury is still out on 15's TV remote, we quite like the new features of the screwdriver, in particular the holographic display elements introduced in the Star Beast. It's always been a little odd how the revival doctors seem to get information from the Sonic screwdriver without any sort of display. Eleven frequently just sort of stared at it and reeled off information or 10 would wiggle it next to his ear like it was whispering to him. The Sonic often serves as a free exposition tool, and having this visual display makes a big difference, with it seeming a little less like the Doctor gaining temporary omniscience for the sake of the plot. And then of course there were the Sonic shades as a temporary switch-up, though let's be honest, they would have been awful if paired with any other modern Doctor. With 12, they, they kind of did work, they did seem exactly like the kind of thing your weird rock and roll uncle would find cool. But I stand by my thoughts, Sonic Shades? Too far. Number 8. A flat team structure Back in the day, a common criticism levelled at the show was the companion dynamic, which often played hard into damsel in distress tropes. Now that's not to say that the classic companions didn't have their moments of heroism, but a less than ideal amount of time was spent screaming, Doctor! Or just screaming in general, particularly the female companions. The trend was bucked with characters like Ace, but the likes of Susan and Mel really didn't have a whole lot to contribute. The 2005 revival saw a major shift shift in this regard, essentially promoting the companions to co-lead, giving them a ton more agency and massively increasing their contribution to saving the day. We also spent a lot more time getting to know them, their families, and giving them meaningful character arcs and journeys. The modern companions are much more well-rounded as a result, and tend to have stronger emotional connections with the Doctor, except Dan, who speaks to 13 about four times and then buggers off. Number 7. Can you hurry up please, or I'll hit you with my shoe? One of the biggest changes in Doctor Who has been an over hall of how stories are structured, and it's a change that's difficult to argue with. Classic Who was heavily serialised, with stories running over many weeks comprising four or six parts, but sometimes stretching to as many as twelve. Granted, the episodes were shorter, but the show famously had a problem with over-padding scripts. Things tightened up as we entered the latter classic years, with the introduction of the 45-minute episode in 1984's Resurrection of the Daleks, and reduced episode counts in the McCoy era. In 2005, we transitioned into a modern form format, with more stories per series spread out across fewer episodes, each with a longer runtime. This also put the pacing issues to bed, forcing writers to submit scripts that were contained within 45 minutes, which thankfully resulted in a bit less fluff. Though this gradual shift to less and less episodes per year is a frustrating one, 14 in 2005 versus 9 in 2024, it has correlated with an increase in production value. It's expensive to make good looking TV these days, and for Doctor Who to compete, quality over quality quantity is ultimately the best approach. Number 6. It's them aliens, I bet my pension! Earth has a rough time of it in the Hooniverse. During the revival alone, our planet has been invaded dozens and dozens of times, and that's just counting the modern day ones. It happened so many times that they made a whole episode that was just a highlight reel of all the previous 
US invasions. If you're living in London, you're asking for it. It's the equivalent of moving to Albert Square or accepting a teaching job at Waterloo Road. Not really worth all the hassle, is it? Despite all this, the general public in most eras of the show seems to not believe aliens exist. At some point, the suspension of disbelief gets to the point where no magic cracks in the fabric of the universe can paper over it. We'd argue that RTD is the one who nailed this particular aspect of the show, quickly knocking that trope on the head in his first series by having the people of the UK fully aware that they live in a hellscape where at any given moment they may be under invasion from a Dalek fleet, an angry Christmas tree, or an army of babies made of fat. It helps make the show that bit more believable and grounded, and thankfully people don't seem too phased about aliens these days either. See Dan booping Carvanista on the nose, or Rose meeting the meat. Number 5. A Bit of a Love Life There was never much time for romance in the classic series, for better or worse. Beyond the odd flirtation, the Doctor never showed much of an interest in anyone or anything, and the companions didn't fare much better unless an excuse was needed to write them out. Many fans decided the Doctor was asexual, and there's certainly an argument for keeping things that way. But then Paul McGann arrived, and any notion of sticking to the famous no hanky-panky on the TARDIS rule went out of the window. The revival continued this trend, with romantic elements feeding into Rose, Martha, Amy, Clara, and Yaz's relationship with the Doctor. We even got the first romantic couple on the TARDIS, excluding Two and Jamie, in Amy and Rory. Love was well and truly in the air, and the success of the revival indicated this was a change for the better. The show even managed to give us a love interest for the Doctor that didn't involve a power imbalance, with River, the best character, solidifying herself as the Doctor's one and only in the eyes of many. Personally, we're very glad that they finally managed to make this work. Number 4. Have you had work done? Classic Who might be a goldmine of quality sci-fi, but even its most ardent defenders must admit it's a tough sell to a modern newcomer. The show's notoriously hokey effects, which were stretching the bounds of credibility even as they aired, are perhaps what it's most remembered for. Unconvincing aliens cobbled together from the BBC's lost property boxes, metal spaceship walls that wobbled if someone sighed too heavily, and planets that all look suspiciously like the same quarry. There's certainly a degree of charm in this, but with hundreds of episodes to get through, we can understand how that charm might start to run a little thin. Over the years, however, these classics have been re-released on DVD and Blu-ray with improved CGI effects. These still aren't necessarily in line with the standards of today, but they go a long way to helping stories like the Dalek invasion of Earth feel a lot less outdated. This goes doubly so for stories like Kinder, which is thankfully no longer stuck with its jumbo-sized novelty inflatable snake, which is now much more convincing. For the purists, though, the effects are optional, so everyone's a winner. Number 3. My Future is in Safe Hands An Adventure in Space and Time is a wonderful one-off biopic that aired as part of the 50th anniversary celebrations. Dramatising the story of the show's creation through to Hartnell's regeneration, it starred David Bradley as the main man and was penned by Mark Gatiss, rather awkwardly blowing any of his actual Doctor Who scripts out the water. It's a must-watch if you haven't already. The tearjerker of a final scene sees Hartnell looking forward at what the show, at what his legacy, will become, at which point he sees Matt Smith standing across from him. If you're sticklers like we are, this scene is ever so slightly undercut by the fact that the green screen Smith is standing in front of the console he's clearly meant to be behind, completely taking you out of the moment. It's a minor oversight, but fans have moaned about it for years. Well, ten years later, an adventure in space and time was broadcast again, but with one vital difference. The green screen mistake was fixed, and even better, it wasn't Smith standing behind the console, it was in fact the first on-screen appearance of Shooty Gatwa as the 15th Doctor. It was a powerful, powerful moment. No other show could do something like this, and the only downside is that we'll know what to expect with version 3 in a decade's time. Number 2. Welcome to the Sisterhood When will we get a female Doctor has been part of the discussion around Doctor Who for far longer than most fans realise. This idea didn't just spring up in the latter half of the revival, it had been batted about for much of the classic era too, with the likes of Joanna Lumley and Dawn French being suggested as possible 7th Doctor candidates by Doctor Who creator Sidney Newman. Of course, these seeds were also planted with the introduction of female Time Lords like Romana and the Rani, but it wasn't until Moffat's era that the idea of gender swapping regenerations was cemented on TV, with the Master being given first dibs, albeit off screen, and the General soon after. With Missy, we got the best incarnation of the Doctor's nemesis ever put to screen, and a complete breath of fresh air. A few years later, the Doctor followed suit. If nothing else, the idea of a female Doctor makes speculation about the next incarnation even more exciting, because it really can be anyone. Never say never on those long standing fan casts of Hayley Atwell and Olivia Coleman. Maybe one day. Number 1. The Last of the Time Lords When Doctor Who returned in 2005, it returned to a vast 
vastly different cultural landscape to the one it left. The schlocky runabout vibe that most casual fans associated with the classic run was, unfairly or not, hard to shake. And so, one of the many smart decisions Russell T Davis made with the ninth Doctor was to modernise the character and give him more of an edge, more in line with the noughties trend towards grittier telly. Gone were the question mark sweaters and technicolour dream coats. This new incarnation sported a buzz cut and a leather jacket, with a dash of crippling loneliness and a heavy serving of PTSD. This was largely due to the time war, possibly the single greatest source of character development the Doctor has had in 60 years. It went a long way to giving 9 and especially 10 mainstream appeal, and has been a well the revival has drawn from for almost 20 years. Loneliness, grief, guilt, rage, hardly groundbreaking characteristics, but they kind of were for the Doctor. In 2005, everyone wanted their heroes to be a little angrier, a little darker. Had this not been the route Russell T Davis chose, the show probably wouldn't have taken off in the way that it did. And there you have it. Speaking of change though, Doctor Who is changing its numbering, so why not check out our discussion about the real reason Doctor Who is resetting to season 1. In the meantime, I've been Ellie for Who Culture, and in the words of River Song herself, goodbye, sweeties.